Hey guys, you guys hear me? All right. Hopefully I've got this thing positioned a little bit better. So the crowd thinned out a little bit. So now we know who the really serious people are. Okay. Let's talk about a couple individual cases. Dima asked me to put together a couple of specific experiences that I've had. I'm still the same person, still me. Talk about a couple successes, a couple failures, and a pivot. About.com was a top information site. It was, uh, we started it, I think we started the company in 1996, okay, over 20 years ago. Over 500 topics. It was the largest, again, uh, we talked about this a little bit before, I think, massively collaborative produced website. It's hundreds of guides, individual people uh, running all these different topic sites. Merged with a company called Prime Media, a large publisher, around 2000, $690 million deal. And then later, a $410 million sale and a $300 million sale. See the numbers going down a little bit? So it's losing a little bit of value. Not necessarily because the company was losing value or it wasn't doing its job. There was just more stuff on the internet. In 1996, there just wasn't that much. This was doing SEO, search engine optimization, before it was a term. So what is it now? It recently, meaning within the past few months, changed its name to dot dash. Uh, the new CEO decided that instead of working off of SEO, off of search engine optimization, got to stop that. Was that was that you? Because I don't, I don't, I don't think I can do that. You hear? All right. So what they did was they rebranded it because the content still had tons and tons of value. But the idea of getting people to come there for search engine optimization wasn't working. The the brand wasn't something people were remembering and coming back to. It was more just catching new people through search engine optimization. But here's the point. This property lasted over 20 years. How many web properties last 20 years? Not too many, just a handful. I mean, there's some, there's some utility companies that have some web hosting companies, but for pure content, <coughs> not too many. So the brand ran its course, but this was a wild success. Lots of people, lots of revenue for multiple companies. What did we face when this happened? Really fast growth. And if you're working at a startup or you work with a startup, that's a really big challenge. The biggest challenge was the growth of company from 20 of us. There were 20 of us that technically co-founded that company. All right, we grew to 500 and back down to 350 when things got a little rough. We had millions of users, billions of page views. Once again, I remind you, this was the, the mid to late 1990s. Technology wasn't out there to handle this kind of volume. There were, there were no cloud services. You had to build everything yourself. There were barely racks. Okay, we, had, we started out running our own servers like a lot of companies do. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you one story. One night, it was, I remember it was New Year's. We were working really hard, and we left to go to our New Year's parties, and then we came back the next morning. And that night, I remember it was cold, and the, the office we were working was just a little bit north of New York City. And me and a couple other guys slept in our server room. Why? You guys are technologists. You know why. Why? Because the servers were throwing off a lot of heat. Okay? So, we, you know, we, we took some blankets or whatever we had, and we crawled around, and we, we lied on the floor. That was, that was what it was like at a startup company when there's just a handful of people trying to get everything done, working 24-7, very dedicated to the mission. But as you grow, something happens. You need professional human resources fast because hiring is very, very hard. It was one of the highest, hardest things we did. So the way we managed it was by, by getting HR in there as, as quickly as possible. And if you're experiencing this as a startup, if you're a product manager at a startup, and you find you're spending too much time uh, with that sort of thing, you need to get professional HR on board. We also had a tight job market for skills, and we talked about that a little bit in the last presentation in a different context. So one of the things we hired, had to do <coughs> is higher very fast. And I messed up a couple of times. This is my fault, OK? I hired a couple of the wrong people. And I had to go through the really painful process of firing a couple of them. I've been really lucky throughout my career. I've only had to do this a handful of times. It's the worst thing in the world. And you never, ever want to do it, affect somebody's life like that. And when you have to fire somebody, it's because you failed as a manager. It's because you hired the wrong person, or you didn't mentor them well enough, or you didn't train them well enough. All right? So that's your fault. It's my fault. Not always. There are sometimes 
people change and sometimes things happen. But most of the time, if it's from that source, it's your fault. So what did I do about this? I didn't, I, this is selfish, I didn't want to feel that way again. I didn't want to have to take away somebody's job again. So one of the things I did was I, I just instituted some skills testing. And the first thing somebody did was have a quick conversation. And they'd sit down at a computer and we'd give them some skills to test for. So this way I didn't have to bother if they didn't pass that test. They didn't even make it past that gate. All right. But what, what wasn't going to happen is somebody couldn't go through an interview and get a job and then end up not succeeding in the role. And then I quickly have to fire them because they didn't really have the skills. Now, did they not have the skills because they lied to me? during the interview, or did they not understand something, or were there's, was there a misunderstanding? It doesn't matter, it's my fault, all right? And I didn't want that to happen again. Now, a lot of people do this, especially for developers, okay? So <coughs> what we did was we instituted some testing for basic HTML and producers and things like that, but as well as for product management, we give them some little tests. Now, you don't want to over-test, because you don't want people to come in and say, oh, you're just gonna steal my ideas and not hire me but something to indicate that they knew what they were doing. I didn't have this problem again, at least not for that reason anyway. Building a tech base from the ground up is hard. Back then, we didn't have software as a service, at least not in the way we think about it now. There were no content management systems to speak of. We had to build our own. So in the last presentation, I talked about build versus buy. Well, we had no choice. We had to build almost everything, and that's challenging. So how did we handle that? We you can't do everything well when you're moving at that kind of speed. So you have to make some really hard decisions. In the last presentation, I talked about how nowadays you need to do everything. Design's gotta be right, every, this has gotta be right. But sometimes you have to make choices and it is that minimum viable product. And that's hard. I know talented engineers, they do something, they wanna get everything right, they wanna get everything perfect. A really talented engineer wants that elegant solution. Sometimes as a product manager, I have to say, look, you know, here's where you have to stop. It's like Picasso and painting. At a certain point, just, just sign the painting. It, it's done. Don't put that last brushstroke on. You're going to ruin it. Not really true for engineers. You're going to make that code just a little bit tighter. The same is true for product management, too. I have to know when to stop. When is enough enough? When is good enough good enough? Usually that's somewhere ROI, return on investment, is the next thing I'm going to do going to incrementally give me more revenue or make my customer happier? And if the answer is no, stop. So that's what I had to learn. I was young and stupid. Now I'm just stupid, no longer young. But that was one of my learnings there. We had started on a Microsoft platform using something called Active Server Pages. I don't even know if that's around anymore. I guess some people use it somewhere. Uh, and .NET's a little different. But we had to do a major cut over to a, to a Linux flavored platform. And what we did there was Agile was kind of around. It's, it's not the same flavor as it was today. And as you guys maybe know, Agile isn't just new. Scrum and Kanban might be a little bit newer, but Agile methods have been around for decades. And there's over 30 of them. There's things like extreme programming. There's a whole bunch of different flavors of Agile. But in this case, Waterfall made the most sense. Why? Because waterfall is useful when you know what the tasks are, when you have a really clear idea what the tasks are, and you've got very complicated dependencies. I can build something called a work breakdown structure, a hierarchical work breakdown structure, and I can draw the dependencies. I can use project management tools to draw the dependencies between the tasks, and I can use something called critical path analysis, or PERT, program evaluation and review technique, and I can draw a line through the critical path, and I can know what the dependencies are in a complicated project. And there were a lot of moving parts here. We had dozens of people working on this. Let me remind you again, at this point, we were doing millions and millions of page views a month. We were one of the I mean, top five or 10 internet companies in, in, in the world, okay, with no support. When I say no support, I mean no AWS, no XR, and, and our vendors couldn't even help us, okay? So this was challenging but we got it done. And then the night we did the cutover, no outage, no problem, okay? So that was a feat. So my learnings there was about the screwdrivers, the right tool for the right task at hand. Sometimes something fast and furious works, whether it's agile or just a big to-do list. Other times, waterfall's just fine. So I go back to what I said in my last presentation. The, the tools, 
the tools are, are things you use to apply to the to the problem at hand. Don't get sucked into the whole, oh, you have to use Scrum, you have to use Kanban, you have to use that. You have to use the appropriate thing for the problem at hand. And you get to choose what that is, hopefully. If you don't, do what you can. But when you have the opportunity to choose, try and look at the world um, as it is and apply the right tool because it'll help you. Our other problem was marketplace was still very new to digital. Consumers, people didn't have the visual language that we take for granted today. Okay, So we just tried to keep very basic, simple UI in there. My role, I was a co-founder, VP product, led product management. Uh, I manage the visual structure, the taxonomy, the file system, everything down to server side includes and, and how the templates were structured. Uh, at that point, I was still doing some front end code. Uh, we really didn't have much CSS. Uh, I, I used JSP for our XML output. And some of what I did was I studied a lot about IA, about information architecture, which was still kind of a new concept then. Uh, but I developed a templating system uh, allowing search and replace of giant code blocks, and that's how we did some of our upgrades. As I said, we didn't have a CMS, so some of it was done manually. The other things I learned there was the higher slow fire fast is both right and wrong. You need to hire slower, all right? That's good. Make sure you're getting the right people, but you don't necessarily fire fast. You got to make sure you assess what's going on, all right? It's your responsibility, I think, to help develop other employees. If something's going wrong, give people a chance to correct. Remember, you're on your own, okay? You, you, you better not suffer any life consequences or have anything weird happen. But for your employees, find out what's going on. They may have, you don't know what, ev everybody, everybody in this room, everybody around you, everybody is potentially fighting battles that you don't know about. I don't know if one of you has a sick kid or, or, or is having trouble in your relationship. I have no idea what's going on with all of you. But I guarantee you at least a couple of you in here are fighting some kind of personal battle that I don't know about. But if you happen to work for me, I think, you know, we, we have responsibilities to each other. We have an economic responsibility to our company to put in a hard day's work. But we also have social responsibilities to each other, all right? So one of the things that I tried to do was be sensitive to that and to make sure that, you know, in terms of developing people that we had budget for training, even if it was just to buy books or have seminars. And I'd have my people, you know, read books and then train the rest of us. And we'd have these little mini sessions in-house when I couldn't afford formal training. Some things are teachable, others aren't. Some things I can fix skills in smart people. I can't always fix attitudes, okay? Culture matters, and it can change over time. Entrepreneurs who join a, a lean, fast-moving company have a different mindset than fast followers and employees who join later. None of them are necessarily bad. But you have to manage the us versus them mentality. It's especially sensitive if some of the early entrepreneurs had things called stock options where they had stake in the company, potentially worth lots and lots of money, and these people had less. For good reason. They joined later. They took less risk. But still, you have to manage that. Right? There's still sparks, though, even in the later employees. Right? There's still live minds and hearts, and that can happen anywhere along the spectrum. Those are the people you want to hire. How do you assess attitude? Some of this is subjective, okay? I look at the bottom of resumes. This, the hard skills you know you need to have. You're gonna check those boxes, okay? But sometimes people put in my interests and things I like to do. I like to find out about the person. What are they into? What do they care about? And I couldn't care less if they agree with me or not. Like, let's see somebody's out there and they're involved with politics. It's not my politics. I don't like it. You know what? I don't care. Here's what I care about, that they care about something. I don't even care what it is. I don't care what their hobby is. I don't care if I think it's a stupid hobby, but that they care about something. Not everybody does. Some people are just wandering through the planet, and that's fine. We need drones, okay? Just not on my team. So I learned about the leader-servant role. I need to guide and lead and offer direction, but I shouldn't do the job, and I shouldn't try to do the job. I get to tell people what to do or how to do it, but not both. Otherwise, I think I'm just a bad manager. People don't leave companies, okay? They don't quit companies. They quit managers, mostly, all right? So what I try to do, it's, it's hard. I, I try to self-assess my own reaction, and my own misspellings, uh, to the output of others. Now, if I don't like something, is it because it's just my opinion, or is it fundamentally wrong? 
So if I can express why it's wrong from a user experience or, or user interface perspective for good reasons, like the older guy who does the eyesight, and I say, okay, the font's not big enough, but here's why. Or I don't care if you're using flat design or skeuomorphic design, that is more 3D, 3D design. Do whatever you want, but have a reason for it. It's because my target market understands this. You know, flat design is fine, but sometimes if you've only got two buttons and one's light and one's gray, if there's a third button, I can tell which one to select. But if there's only two, I'm not sure really which the on and off state is, okay? So there's some things that are right or wrong, and there's other things that are just opinion. My favorite color doesn't matter, but the color being wrong for the market does matter. So you need to know the difference. So you need to assess your own perspective. Let me tell you a quick story about the parable of the three stone cutters. I don't know if you guys have ever heard this. It was popularized by management guru Peter Drucker, once again, who I managed before. What's this guy doing here? Actually, we, I know you want to go fast, so I'm going to go quickly here. Guy's walking through a forest in old, old England. Comes upon this first guy here. He says, what are you doing? He's kind of grumpy. He says, I'm hacking at this stone. Comes across the second guy. This guy's a little happier. He's whistling a little bit. What are you doing? I'm, I'm shaping a corner piece, and I'm going to be the best stone cutter ever. Third guy, what are you doing? There's a light in his eyes, and he's happy. What are you doing? I'm building a cathedral. Okay? Same thing. Looks like the same task. Here's the lessons. The first one's earning a fair day's pay. Good for him. The second one wants to do a decent job, mostly for himself. The third one, the third one has a vision and commitment. Oddly enough, it's the second cutter that's potentially a problem. The first one's doing a job. The third one is potentially a leader who can share his vision with other people. But that second one, that second one wants to do it for himself. Now, it's good. We should all strive for personal excellence, but hopefully in the service of something bigger, all right? Because most studies show that that's more highly motivational. It makes people happier, too. But this guy may be a good worker, but he's also a mercenary. He's going to leave for a better job or for more money. He doesn't care about culture. He may not care about your mission. He's in it for himself, all right? It's a dangerous, dangerous attitude. So what are you building? What are you guys building? All right? Do you care about it? That's a little toy plane I built for my little girl. That's her dresser. This is a snowman I made, but I made it out of wood, so even when the snow melted, it'd be fine. How do you turn this, a bunch of boards, and use tools to turn it into this, my minimum viable product, okay? And then this, something beautiful, okay? Obviously, I like to make stuff with wood. It helps to actually care. At least I think it does. And it doesn't matter whether you're doing woodworking or coding and put it in here. It, it makes a difference in the output, I think. All right. Other people might not. Other people disagree. But this is my perspective on it. Open Sky. What it is, it's an expert-driven personal shopping experience. It's high-quality curated goods. 70,000 independent merchants, over 20 million shoppers. It's VP of product. I was not a co-founder of this company, but I was early in. I did some of the initial technical development of some of the first stores, the information architecture, wire, a lot of stuff, right? Early in, you have to do everything. So I, I implemented Salesforce, not just Salesforce, apps on top of Salesforce to do all kinds of crazy stuff, order management, and reverse logistics, if you know what that is, product returns, which are just a royal pain in the butt. Kills your margins. It's very complicated to do. <coughs> Early design, later designs. The customer-facing front end can only come together with the functional tools for the merchant to create and manage the experience. So I would I did the wireframes for that and you know some of the front end code. You can leverage cheap MVP on people, but the thing is the transition to better technology is going to be painful. So my learnings here, like we implemented Salesforce and we did a lot of custom code on top of it, but it can cost a lot of money. So sometimes you make the decision to buy, but you don't necessarily calculate all the full cost of ownership. We ended up spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on our Salesforce impl implementation. Now, it ended up being worth it. Like I said, we weren't just using basic Salesforce. We put a lot of apps on top of it. But we didn't have the skills in-house to build all that. We could build it. We had, we, at this point, we had some talented developers. But there were other companies out there that were experts in Salesforce. So we hired them, paid them a lot of money, got it done because we needed to do it fast. So my lesson was learn a little bit more about what you're in for before you make that purchase. 
I also learned that payments can be really complicated in stupid ways. Stupid, stupid little things that can take up so much of your time. I'll never forget this 37 cent thing. There was this payment processing thing that happened and somehow, <coughs> I think it was my fault, I don't remember exactly how, but something was off by 37 cents, okay? And it was with some kind of return. And I had to do like crazy things and it had to reconcile with the accounting system and here and there. It took me a day to solve this problem. And I had to solve the problem because I didn't know where this bug was. I didn't know exactly what happened. 37 cent. Took me a day, a day of my time to solve a 37 cent problem. Okay? So <laughs> you gotta pay attention to the details earlier, not that that happened. Again, we had to deal with growth, small startup, limited funds. One of the answers was I just started doing some of the tech myself. All right, and I didn't know what I was doing. I, I shouldn't have been doing this. I should not be writing production code for anyone, even even at that point in my career when I was doing a little bit of code. I was writing shell scripts to, to deploy multi-site Magento shopping to, to all these different things on a virtual host Unix platform. And I had no idea what I was doing. I was sitting there with my learn Unix in a week book and doing stuff. And this was for production code, all right, for, for what became a you know sizable website. Um, but sometimes you have to do that. You have to get your hands dirty. Reverse logistics we talked about. Shipping systems are a mess and still to this day aren't fixed. But this is an example that I talked about in the last presentation. There's pain points there, but you can't go in and fix them. You might say, oh, I will come in and fix this, but you're not. Because you might know how to fix that code and you might look at that user interface and say, I can do better than this and you can, but you got $20 billion to get a fleet of planes and trucks to do all the other stuff? No, you don't. So a lot of times we suffer collectively and we suffer with bad UI, bad user experience. Where do we suffer most? Government and healthcare and things like that. Why? Because these people just don't have to care about customer service. They have a captive audience. Okay, and there's nothing you can do about it. But this is one of the reasons why people will leave other products. Sometimes the way they're behaving, it isn't that they like something, it's something called learned helplessness, which is a psychological concept. It's something prisoners suffer. It's different from Helsinki syndrome where somebody identifies with their captor. It's more along the lines of, I give up, I'll just do this. But it doesn't mean they love you. It doesn't even mean, even mean they like you. It means the moment something better comes along, they're gone. So you have to be careful with your decisions in terms of what you think is good enough because they'll leave you. My learnings here, drop shipping is complicated, especially when dealing with merchants and manufacturers with widely varied technical capacity. Some people would say, just give me the API. Love them, thank you. Others would say, send us a fax. You guys even, to some of you younger kids, here, do you even know what a fax machine is? You get the bump, boop, boop, boop. <laughs> the paper goes through. And here's the scariest part. The thing you're faxing was printed from a computer and you could see it came off a, a dot and a laser printer, whatever it was, an inkjet printer. It goes through a fax machine and someone on the other end is typing it into a computer. And you're just thinking, this is medieval. It's like that castle, okay? This can't be happening in 2008 or 2011, I think 2010, um, whatever. Others would say, email us the info so we can print a mailing label. All right, the systems were incompatible, fine. At least they could cut and paste. So. Part of the point was this, and it remains the opportunity. Things like Etsy, Amazon Marketplace, Shopify, all of these things benefit from the fact that small merchants and manufacturers have old systems. And it goes back to the transaction cost that was in the last presentation. None of those people are gonna build those systems themselves. They can't. Big opportunity, and this is why this is a multi-billion dollar industry. Akuna, where's George? George isn't here. George, whom I work with at this company, George and I worked on this, I think, in 2008. All right, so this is going back almost 10 years ago now. So I've known George for a long time. This was a $120 million failure, US dollars, around 2008. This, this is what this company did. It just burned money. What it really was, it was multiple lines of business, so it was a little messed up. An alternative search engine that provided results for some Chinese partners, business profile searches, whatever, and one small division called Twing, my division. Right. 
my role was VP product. I was brought into the company to see if there was something they could do with their search product. They had a lot of technology, but it wasn't being deployed well. It wasn't working. Could I do something? And there was. I used some of those tools I showed you last time in the last presentation. We found a gap, gap analysis, looking at the holes in the marketplace. We looked at search. We looked at what people did. And it had to do with surfacing valuable content in forums and communities. Everybody talks about community, community, community. Well, a lot of things is a blog a community. Maybe if there's a lot of comments around it, but maybe not. Community, by definition, is people with shared interest. So we found that gap, and we defined requirements, wireframes, and I did some of the P&L and marketing. So here was an example of where, <coughs> as, a, as a product person, all of a sudden, I wasn't just working on the, the product itself. I was also working on some of the business parts of it. It was a vertical market. Niche search service. Great. Niche search, niche. Hi. Nice to see you again. Niche search service uh, performs in community. And it was doing well. If you do a search for my last name and the name Twing, you'll find all kinds of interviews I did, radio interviews, um, interviews with various types of tech publications. People like this product. It was a good product. Made me very happy. But what happened was, Hi again. The parent company blew up financially from the other failed business units. So we tried to reorganize right around this business unit and sell that product alone. Myself, the general manager, and the CTO, with the CEOs, the chief executive officer's permission, we said we want to take this division out. And we went searching for venture capital. We wanted, I don't know, $5 million or something. Not a lot of money. It seems like a lot of money, but it's what we wanted, OK? We found it. We found people willing to give us $5 million because we proved the business case here and the mathematics of the business case. But it didn't work out because we were too late, all right? One of the things, do, 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 do. One of the things that happened is we were going after social content, but we were wrong about the type of content. Twitter was just starting to grow at this point, all right? It was too soon to tell what kind of value it might be, but the better move would have been to collect Twitter if we had done that, maybe we would have been able to exit and get it better on time. But what happened was some of our contracts with the parent company were so complicated that I couldn't carve out this division, all right? And this wonderful product ended up failing with the rest of the company. And by the way, this is part of my fault, all right? I made the decision on forums and communities because I love forums and communities, and I'd used them a lot. I didn't fully understand Twitter yet. Actually, to some degree, I still don't. And we could talk about that for a long time. But at that point in time, looking forward, I didn't see this, OK? I don't know if it would have helped, but maybe. The point is, it should have been an explicit decision. I should have said, I'm going after this first because of x, not, oh, I don't care about that. All right? I didn't look at this. This was a painful lesson. So. My lesson here was to try and recognize uh, failure earlier and act. The small group of us that tried to do this had the opportunity to do it, and we didn't do it. The other thing I learned was about fi fiscal responsibility and a wind down, financial responsibility. The CEO of the parent company was a talented financial executive, so he made the right decision. He said, look, we're burning cash. We're going to go out of business. Let's do it right, okay? You can't just fail. Like, I, you guys might not care about this, but if you're ever involved with a startup or you become a business leader where you're involved at that level, you can't just go out of business and go away because there's financial repercussions for that. And at a certain point, you can actually become criminally liable for some things. There's some things where you can be sued, but other things are just wrong. So we wound down the company. Uh, and, and seeing how he did that responsibly was an important lesson. All that's left of this is a patent. Now, for some reason, I'm the only one on this patent, which isn't really fair. Uh, I, don't know how, I don't know how that happened. I, I didn't do that. There should be a team on there. Um, my, an old blog of mine and, and, and those stories that I told you about. So let's move on to a pivot then. Uh, this is adkeeper.com, nowkeep.com. This was an innovative means for consumers to try to, to try to own their own advertising experience. What we were doing was we were putting little buttons on ads all over the internet, billions of ads, so you could keep them for later, kind of like Pinterest or a like button or things like that. It's actually a brilliant idea. The idea is that 
banner ads were interrupting your experience, but you could save them for later if they interested you. So I think it was a spectacular idea, but sometimes things don't always work out so well, even with a seemingly good idea. We had big marketing and sales, all right? Here's New York City, there's a big banner here and stuff like that, so we were, we were spending a lot of money. Big funding from big names, we had $35 million in a Series B financing, and $43 million total capital spent. All right, now we still have some of that money. The company's still in business as this new thing. Successful name brand CEO, a guy I've worked with before, he's a good friend. Experienced product and technology team, really talented developers, we built a wonderful product. Everybody got, though, that this was a big experiment. If this had worked, it would have been great for the brands. Okay, brand loved this, but consumers didn't care. Remember, we talked about the whiff them, the what's in it for me. Why did it fail? People have banner blindness. Most people don't even see banner ads. Only 8% of people click on them. They're useful for halo effect of branding, okay? But people don't really use them. We couldn't really educate consumers. Only two or three companies on the planet get to do that. Google, Microsoft, Facebook. No one in this room should be implementing a new button or a new icon, okay? You don't have the marketplace power to do that. Use the iconography, use the things that, that other people have injected into the marketplace first. People won't understand. And if they don't understand, at first they get frustrated because they think it's them. And then they realize, no, it's not me, it's you. And they get angry at you. And either way, they abandon your product. So consumer education. Here's the important one, though. No one cared. It didn't provide enough value for them, okay? All right, very good. See what I said there? $43 million. $43 million. How many companies could you build for $43 million? Most companies get funded, you know, if you, a few hundred thousand, right? $43 million. So potentially, you, you could potentially fund 100 startups for that money. All right? What is it now? It's a fashion brand using the Keep technology that we developed, like a Pinterest, for shopping. And it's also got universal shopping cart technology, so you can buy across unconnected merchants. So what did the pivot do? Now, I had actually left the company at this point, sort of. I was still consulting with them and doing other things. But, you know, I personally had loyalty to, to the staff there and to the CEO and, you know, also stock options, okay? So it was somewhat selfish. But uh, what happened was it's now a new and useful product. It's not necessarily the biggest hit in the world, but there's actually hope for the future but the other one wasn't. How did that happen? Because it was a mature group of product owners there. We looked at the numbers. We knew what was happening, okay? We couldn't ignore it. Some people might ignore it. We said, okay, we got X dollars left. Let's pivot, let's do something else. And this ended up being what the thing was. So as the VP product and co-founder, and I worked on product strategy and roadmap requirements and things like that, we actually developed some interesting intellectual property. And we've got a few patent applications out there, a couple of them winding their way through. And, you know, we also actually own a few other patents that I haven't listed here. So the company's actually got some interesting value. Here's the other thing I learned here. It matters who you're working with. All right, we don't always have to be the best buddies, but we need to get along okay. Because when things are good, it's great. You got the foosball table, you got the snacks in the cafeteria. But when things get rough and money gets tight, or even if, you know, your CEO says, look, I need you to take a pay cut. I'll give you more stock, but will you stay with me? And you do that, and you do things out of loyalty, all right? A good team matters most when things get most challenging. And that's why maybe you've heard me sort of, you felt this as I've spoken through things. I care a lot about who I'm working with and what I'm doing, all right? We can all get jobs, different places, right? For me, I, it matters who I'm spending most of my day with, okay? Analytics are everything. These are the other learnings. If the business isn't working, adjust it. If it's still not working, Consider if you have a strategy, timing, or tactics issue. I talked about this a little bit before. If it's tactics, that's fixing execution. I can do that. Maybe I can stay alive long enough to do that. If I don't have enough runway, meaning enough money, maybe I can get more money, okay? That's solvable. If it's timing, that might be solvable if I wait. If it's strategy, then you better change while you still have runway or time, because that's the company killer, all right? That's about it, all done.